Hello and welcome to the Zoomer Hall concert series. I'm Kathleen Kajioka. As always at Zoomer Hall, we're in a four and one operation, a live concert, a live radio broadcast to the new Classical FM network. We're live on the web at classicalfm.ca where you can see everything that's happening here. And it's a taping of a future episode of the concert series airing on Vision TV. Well, at the Zoomer Hall Concert Series, we've been giving proof to Canada's claim of wealth in the world of singers. We've had such tremendous talent here at Zoomer Hall, and uh, the trend continues, because today we're going to hear not from one, but two vocal luminaries. Christina Zabo, phenomenal mezzo-soprano, known for her intensely committed performances and gorgeous mahogany voice, and Philip Addis, a spellbinding performer with a creamy baritone. They have both studied mainly in Canada and have now taken their places on the world stage alongside so many of their compatriots. Right now, they're starring together in the world premiere of Pyramus and Thisbe at the COC. This is an operatic evening that spans 400 years <laughs> from Monteverdi all the way up to contemporary composer Barbara Monk Feldman. And this is a leap that these two versatile singers make very easily. Today, they're gonna meet somewhere in the middle, singing music by Mozart, Handel, Rossini, and others. It's gonna be a great hour. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christina Zabo and Philip Addis. scritto ve che bestia ve che bestia il maestro faccio a lei fobladi avete miei io comincio a respirar a 
fucking carter cost the money chop on the Sorprendente, son galante, e son sargente, non va bella che resista alla vista d'un cimiero, ce di amarte di ogoria. Fin 
one of Handel's big operatic hits, and for a good reason. That was Ombra Maifu from the opera Xerxes, sung by Christina Zabo. And before that, we had Philip Ada singing Donizetti from L'Elysée d'Amour, uh, Come Paride e Vezzoso. And they started off the set singing together music from Rossini's Barber of Seville. We heard Dunque Io Son. I really love to host these concerts because I get to hear such amazing performers up close. We are going to hear more great singing and have a bit of a chat when we come back at Zoomer Hall. I just want to say how wonderful your voices are and how wonderful your acting is. You make the song so much more interesting by the acting that you've done as well. And I can see your bone structure and everything you do is perfect for your singing. <laughs> Why, thank you. Are you a voice teacher? <laughs> I'm a singer. Great, wonderful. Pass. Anybody have any other questions? Anybody have any questions? Uh, I just wanted to know why I think uh, you were mentioning before about the great Canadian talent that we have here in Canada, you know, specifically singers. I think years ago people thought we would have, have had to have left Canada perhaps to go south or go to Europe. Um, how has the landscape changed here in Canada for singers? There are many great opportunities for us here in Canada. Um, and, uh, but that being said, uh, it's also, it is a great experience to go and work elsewhere, not just for exposure, but just to experience different ways of putting on, in, in opera especially, putting on uh, productions. There just are sort of different ways of going about it in, in Europe, say, or even in the States. Um, but I know we've both been very fortunate to have, well, all of Canada's opera companies support us. Uh, um, you know, as we've built our careers, it's it, it's been really valuable to be able to sing for Canadians. Um, and you know, I, I know that everyone really likes sort of that homegrown element. Um, we can sense people's pride in us, and and likewise, we're we're proud to have such um, knowledgeable and inviting audiences. It's great. Three and a half minutes to air. Three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. I've got No, no, no. Oh. You good? Okay, go ahead. Oh, so, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> ah, tricked you. <laughs> uh, you might get too There you go. There. Go ahead. So I'm curious to know when, for both of you, when you made the decision to do opera. I mean, obviously you could be singing pop and maybe that's a, a good money maker if, uh, you know, if you can hit the, the high time. But I just wonder if you could say uh, at what point or what person or institution might have influenced you to choose opera. Sure. Um, first of all, I mean, w whether you choose a course, uh, you know, a path in pop or jazz or whatever, it's uh, all of these are highly competitive, so, and you, I think you have to just choose it because something gets you that you get the bug. Uh, for me, I, 
I was studying music, doing my, my bachelor's uh, at Queens when I had my first voice lesson and realized that I could do more artistically uh, as an opera singer than I was able to do, uh, you know, playing tuba in the symphony. <laughs> so for me, that, that, that was sort of the turning point. Um, I, I was a music ed major at Western, and um, I was as a piano major as well. So I, I changed tracks in the middle of that. Um, I had always wanted to take voice lessons. Both of us have sung in the Toronto Children's Chorus as children. Yeah. And so I've always sung, but it was never something that I considered as a career op option. So I was, I was all set to be a teacher. And um, I started taking voice lessons, and the, it, it really does. The, the bug sort of gets you. This is really exciting. And by fourth year university, I was in the, every production I could possibly be in. And it was really exciting to be on stage. So the bug kind of got me, and that's, the rest is history. <laughs> Thanks. Tom, does this go to Philip? I don't think she, are you, are you talking to her? Probably not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in case question comes to you. Welcome back to Zimmer Hall. We are live with two wonderful singers, Christina Zabo and Philip Addis. I'm Kathleen Kajioka, and we're going to have a chat uh, with Philip first before we hear more great music. You were a science major, I understand. Well, in, in high school, I'd, I'd studied uh, mainly science, but um, at, I always had music as extracurricular activity. I was in uh, bands and, and choirs at uh, Humberside Collegiate here in Toronto. Oh, no kidding. Uh, yeah, in the West End. Um, but until sort of the last possible date when you can change your application for university, um, my, uh, my applications had been for engineering um, at, uh, I forget where, anyway, so Ontario universities. But I switched to music, um, yeah, it was like in April. And I had to do late auditions. Um, I just wasn't satisfied with where I was headed and had to kind of ask myself, okay, well, what can I do that, that I have some degree of talent at? And uh, realized that music had been there all along, but I had sort of taken it for granted for a long time. Interesting. Was yeah. it a scary decision to make? To make yeah, it was lead? a risk. It was a risk. I think I kept one of those applications uh, as engineering just in case I was making a huge right. mistake. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I ended up doing my bachelor's at Queen's and then um, went to U of T for uh, an operatic diploma. And after that, went to Montreal for a, an apprenticeship with uh, l'Opéra de Montréal. Um, and then, yeah, I've just been freelance since then. It's been wonderful. Obviously a great decision. Um, <laughs> yeah, who knew? I, I'm wondering about, I always, I'm curious what singers think about the particular Canadian climate for singers, because it really is extraordinary how many amazing vocalists that we produce. What is it? Is it the air? Is it the yeah. training? Is it, I, what is it? Yeah, I've been asked if it's something in the water, but I don't know. It's hard to put your finger on. I, I think... When I think about my development and what I have benefited from is the, the really high quality teaching that has existed at, at throughout Canadian universities. Um, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have great 
vocal teachers and vocal coaches to sort of get me along the way. Because um, you can have talent, but if it isn't sort of fostered, then you, you may end up being a bit directionless. So um, that said, I mean, it's, it's not just music education, but it's sort of that general uh, higher level of education that we have here in Canada. We're very fortunate uh, to have people who kind of get it and who understand the importance of the arts. I see. So um, what I want to actually ask next is about your uh, career in opera. What was your first principal role? <laughs> it was a... I, I'm laughing because, I mean, there's sort of nowhere to go. Uh, it was Jesus, actually. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a new opera um, that I was roped into doing uh, when I was in my undergrad uh, at Queen's. Um, and it was based on various gospels that were stitched together. So I guess, in a way, it was a staged oratorio, since it's you know it's based on sacred texts. But um, but it was set like an opera, and uh, <laughs> I had never even seen an opera, and yet I was singing the role of Jesus in this in this show. Really? You know, and I I think I managed. But um, <laughs> and then yeah, that's anyway. Where do you go from there? Yeah, so never having seen an opera, were you drawn to opera, or was it just singing in general? Yeah, I had only just started st studying voice, and um, some other students at, um, at Queen's were starting up a student-run opera program, because it didn't really exist there. And so they had a, a composer um, who had just composed this piece, and, and uh, uh, Ron Beckett was his name. Um, and uh, yeah, we just, uh, it was... Uh, I went into it pretty blindly, but it was a great experience. And uh, I, learned, I actually learned quite a lot in that first production about you know, being present uh, in, in the middle of a performance, you know, because um, I hadn't performed at all as a soloist in any way. Uh, in right, because it's not a situation where you sing your bit and then you sure check your watch while other people are doing other things. Yeah. No, you're you on stage to... the whole time, and you have to be completely. <laughs> I've actually seen that. By immersed. The way. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That's definitely that's not for me. Uh, I I think it's really important to tell the story constantly, whether you're singing or not. Actually, the current show that I'm involved in, uh, Pyramus and Thisbe at the Canadian Opera Company, I probably well, I certainly spend more time not singing than I do singing. But there's a lot of physicality involved. Uh, so acting e even without words. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because yeah, you do spend a lot of time sort of silent. And what um, I don't know, what, are, what are you focused on while you're uh, while the others are singing? Well, during I'm, I'm really listening um, and not tuning out. <laughs> you know, I'm really listening to what what it is they're singing about and then reacting to that, as you would in a conversation. Um, you know, so that it's, it's it ends up being a fairly genuine reaction. I mean, I'm still doing. The staging, as just you know, as I was told to do, it's it's not improv. You know, improv but um, that being said, I mean, I, it's still I try to really maintain that moment of being attentive to what they're doing, and then you know we we devised sort of a, a plot line for my character, even even when he's not singing, uh, which you have to do with any character actually. No, and, no one sings uh, through a, a whole opera. No, of course not. Well, actually, speaking of opera in general, I've read that you find opera to be less vulnerable than other performance forms for voice. Well, there, uh, there's a structure there in opera that supports you. Um, the not just the costumes and lights, but there's there's something about it and, and the way it's rehearsed. By the time you get to the performance, it, it, it tends to be uh, relatively comfortable. You. you you iron out all, all the sort of unpredictable elements, whereas you know in a recital or in something like like this, actually, it's much more um, intimate and immediate. And um, yeah, it's I mean here we are. I can I can make eye contact with everyone in the room. Uh, whereas if you've got glaring lens flare from uh, the lighting in the production, it's it's not that it's less uh, you're less connected to the audience because I can still hear them gasping or you know mm -hmm. being connected to the show. But somehow that does create, you know, what they call the fourth wall, you know, that so that, you know, I can just maintain the character without having to, you know, be uh, just myself in person. That's uh, that's that takes a, a certain amount of trust between the audience and the performer. Well, now we are going to, uh, in this intimate environment, hear more from Philip Addis. Here he is with uh, a accompanist who is also his wife, who I actually was, oh, well, we're out of time to check. That's right, this is Emily Hamper. Emily Hamper, a wonderful pianist, uh, clearly a strong musical and personal connection here at Zoomer Hall. Thank you. Oh, 
Che 
That was music by Mozart from Così Van Tutte, uh, Il Core Vidono, sung by Philip Addis and Christina Zabo. Before that, uh, Christina sang music by uh, Meyerbeer, Noble Seigneur Salut from Les Huguenots. And uh, but starting off the set was Philip Addis on his own, well, with all accompanied by uh, Emily Hamper, of course. Music from uh, Gounod's Faust, uh, Vendée Quité. More great music to come and another chat when we come back, so stay with us. Hi, thank you for such wonderful singing. I was just curious to know, when you sing in a much larger venue, such as at the Four Seasons Center, do you have to use a different voice or different technique? Because you obviously have to project and carry your voice into a much you know, greater distance. In, uh, the way we're singing today is pretty technically pretty much similar to what we do in the Four Seasons. Uh, we're very lucky, actually, the Four Seasons, I mean, it was the whole reason to build it, it is acoustically fantastic and actually quite easy to sing in. So, no, like, I certainly wouldn't, I don't, I don't have much more to give than what I gave at the end of, <laughs> of Ombikite. Like, that's, that's pretty much maximum here or there. Um, yeah, what we can afford to do here that, well, you can sometimes get away with it in the Four Seasons, depending on the, um, whatever the accompaniment is. Uh, we can go slightly more intimate in this context. Uh, the pianissimo that we were doing towards the end of that, that duet was, yeah, you could probably pull that off in, in, in the big theater as well. But yeah, so it doesn't actually change a whole lot. And fundamentally, we have to still support properly or else uh, we'll get tired. <laughs> so, yeah. so we still have to sing well. We can't just come off the voice and kind of whisper it. Yeah. Thank you, and no mics over there, right? No, well, okay. these are just for broadcast, so. but no, <laughs> exactly, exactly right. 
Uh, hold on, who's starting? Yeah. Uh, we have seen Pyramus and Tisbet twice and really admired your performances. I am wondering what kind of challenge that uh, opera meant for you both. Have a comment? Oh, sure. Um, for me, it was uh, where, because it's not just the Pyramus and Thisbe, there are three operas. That, oh mini scenes before, two mini scenes before we hit Pyramus and Thisbe. Um, the through line musically and in terms of my character's trajectory is probably the biggest challenge. Um, and for me also lying dead for about 12 minutes is uh, <laughs> in a comfortable position. Um, on opening, what I did it was opening, I got my foot caught in his pants when I died. And you're not supposed to move when you're dead. So <laughs> I was trying to very subtly get my foot out of his. I don't know how I did that. The hem, the hem it was very funny. <laughs> it never happened before ever. So th th yeah. there's some very strange challenges. You know, we have a scarf that we interact with. And is the scarf landing in the right place? Or the chairs hitting the right yeah. spikes? It, all these funny little things you have to think about um, in this show. But that's, that's the joy of live performance, is that there are definitely some unknown elements that you then have to react to uh, or work around, uh, depending if it's a, a good or bad sort of a spontaneous moment. But um, yeah, no, that's you know, that, uh, for me uh, the biggest challenge was actually getting rid of my expectations and my sort of prejudices. Um, I've done all kinds of opera, but but this is quite a singular piece for me um, in terms of how I thought of it in terms of the dramatic arc. Uh, it's actually, this piece is very much about um, sort of a sustained, uh, suspended reality. We don't have this sort of very basic structure of uh, conflict, uh, climax, resolution. It's, it's not that kind of storytelling. It's a, it's, a, it's a more suspended reality which can make people uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable in, in rehearsal until I kind of accepted that aesthetic. And then I actually found the beauty within it. But it's, it's certainly a challenge um, to present. And I know it's a challenge for the audience, but I think our audiences are up for that challenge. Sure. Three minutes to air. Three. Here you go. Just hold on one second. I'll let you know when. Go ahead. Hi. As a former language teacher, one of the things that always fascinates me when I listen to uh, operatic singing um, is the ability of singers, such as both of you, to sing in other languages. So my question relates to uh, what languages that operas are typically sung in uh, do you, um, did you study? Uh, which of the languages do you enjoy singing in? And which of the uh, languages would you say to yourself, mm, I'd rather not? does present its own challenge. Um, I'll answer the first part, which is that, yes, we've had to study the languages pretty thoroughly. Um, and even still, we constantly need to be reminded of the, the nuances of whatever language we're rehearsing. That's what vocal coaches are for. Uh, Emily's uh, expert at, at uh, keeping us in line. In terms of diction, yeah, for me, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, you know, uh, she, coaches, she coaches me all the time. So. Um, yeah, so it's, it, but you have to really learn it and understand it. Uh, for me, actually, I find some of my most challenging singing is in English, despite being my first language, or maybe because it is, um, I have a typical, I think, Canadian accent, and that, in terms of singability, actually can present some problems. It's sort of a, a backwards sort of a place where we put our, our sound. And to sing it, you have to like find a different spot to resonate, or else you can kind of get in trouble. So the habits are hard to get rid of. Uh, a new language, like well, relatively new to me, like Italian, uh, which I learned later in life, it's not so hard because I didn't have all the habits to go with it. Um, I actually have only, I mean, I grew up speaking Hungarian, so I, I've had that, and I feel like that has given me <clears throat> the ability to get language in my ear a little better, um, and obviously French, because um, the school system. Um, I've never studied any other language other than French and spoken Hungarian, so I, a lot of it has been um, winging it along the way, and uh, very good diction coaches. Once you hit the young artist level, they have diction coaches constantly, so, um, and I love the flavor of languages. It's just, it's fun to figure languages out. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I've done a bit 
of German uh, in Austria. So you start to when you start to work in other countries as well. That's wow. Sorry, we gotta go. Sorry. We gotta go. <laughs> I just have got our big screen. 30. All right. 30 seconds. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, another mic. Okay. I have to oh. talk. Oh, you talk. Okay. I talk. Do I talk. Okay. 15, okay. 15, 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome back to Zoomer Hall. I'm Kathleen Kajioka and I'm here with Philip Addis and Christina Zabo, who've just sung a beautiful set. Christina, you are one of the most versatile singers I've ever seen, and it's actually such a pleasure to hear this repertoire because I usually, I've heard you sing either very old music or very new music, which is actually the case in Pyramus and Thisbe. Yes. Um, in terms of versatility, what makes it possible for you? Is it, is it a question of your instrument? Is it a sensibility thing? Because not everybody can pull off all the music that you do. I guess so. Um, I think part of it is just uh, I'm stubborn, and <laughs> I will make anything work. Um, and also work ethic, good technique, obviously. Um, I, I've had very good te teachers um, in my life, so that's been I, I've been very blessed in that respect. But it's also, I feel like, a willingness to try, a willingness to try things out. Um, the contemporary music sort of f fell upon me. Um, it's not something I sought out necessarily, but um, I feel like my willingness to experiment with colors. And um, actually, I was, I was remembering very, uh, just the other day, uh, someone said to me, we had done a Domineo at the Canadian Opera Company, and uh, Neil Crory, a CBC producer, said to me, that was very beautiful, Christina, but you have to try and get some more colors of your singing. I thought, oh, what's wrong? I haven't, I, it's, not, it's not right. So, and so I, that's when it kind of, t I have to, and in order to stand out, I feel like you have to, you have to experiment a little bit and a willingness um, to, to go places. So in Pyramus and Thisbe, I come off my voice entirely. I'm, I actually have to scream a little bit in, and make vocalisms within and then come back to, to good singing. So you have to figure these things out by experimentation and I'm willing to go there. So Yeah, that's really clear. I, I, <laughs> I experienced Death and Desire actually in June with Against the Grain Theatre right. and was so stunned by your singing of these incredible Messiaen songs, which, which brings me actually to the whole um, involvement in new productions, new opera. I mean, that wasn't new opera, but that was an experimental yep. kind of presentation. But you're involved a lot in the creation of new roles. What is that like? Um, it's exciting. I mean, it's, I have never, I mean, I'm a mezzo-soprano, uh, but I've never been a classical mezzo-soprano. I'm sort of on the borderline of soprano. So I don't fit in boxes very well. And um, so conventional opera doesn't always fit. So when I do new productions and new works, I, I have a freedom. And also with, uh, funnily enough, with, with early music as well, there's less of a um, constrictiveness there. So I, I, it's fun for me. I don't fit in boxes as well, and I like to bust out. So and the contemporary music reflects that. That's true. Maybe that's why a lot of early music people do a lot of new music and vice versa. Yeah, I, think so. I think, well, there's the, in early music, there is a different... Um, availability for the presence of the performer, I guess. Mm -hmm. Everything's less dictated. Yeah. Um, now, coming back to the music in the middle, I've read that, you know, for all of this uh, other repertoire that you do, that you really love Mozart. I do love Mozart. What is it about Mozart? Um, it's just, it's clean, it's lyrical, it's beautiful. There's, I mean, there's nothing really quite like Mozart. And it's not easy, necessarily. But it really, and also, I feel like it suits my voice. So I've... Uh, I've done a lot of Mozart, actually, trouser roles um, for high mezzo. And also, like, mezzo roles are kind of, like, second soprano -y in Mozart. So really, that, again, fits my voice type. Okay. Yeah, speaking of trouser roles, yeah. I mean, as a mezzo, then you have to often have to play yes. men or male characters. How do you do that? How do we do that? <laughs> um, costumes. Um, uh, the ch I mean, vocally, that's not the part. The, getting into inhabiting the character of a of a usually a young boy, young man, um, is is the challenge. So I, you know, I've I've watched how men stand. I've watched how they walk and swagger or whatever. Um, some men and uh, <laughs> trying to incorporate that into into my physicality. Um, it's harder for me, being quite a womanly person, <laughs> to 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 embody that entirely. So when when costumes get involved, that totally helps me out. It just makes makes me able to inhabit that character even more so. 
Well, you're about to sing one of those trouser rolls now. Carubino, <laughs> tell us a bit about this character. Oh, he's fun. Um, he's in love with love. He's in love with every woman. In the, he's a hormonal teenager. So <laughs> 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 Some things never change. So. <laughs> Okay, we are going to hear a very famous aria from Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, Voice Sapete, sung by Cristina Zabo. <laughs> Des verrückt 
Alters feindlich lauschen, fürst der Holde nicht, fürst der Holde nicht. Die Nacht, die Galen schlagen, ach, sie flehen dich. Mit den Tönen süßen Klagen flehen sie für mich. Verstehen des Busen Sehnen, kennen Liebe Schmerz, kennen Liebe Schmerz, rühren mit den Silbertönen jedes weiche Herz, jedes weiche Herz. Lass auch dir die Brust bewegen, Liebchen, höre mich. Beben tar ich dir entgegen. Komm, beglücke mich, komm, beglücke mich.
Jabo and Philip Addis, a piece of by Mozart, La Ciudad La Mano from Don Giovanni. Before that, uh, Philip sang music by Schubert, his tension or serenade, and starting off the set was Voiki Sapete from The Marriage of Figaro, sung by Christina. And they were joined at the piano by Emily Hamper, an amazing performance, and you can catch the two of them at the COC, they are performing in the world premiere of Barbara Monk Feldman's Pyramus and Thisbe on now, and you can find out more at coc.ca. That's all for us at Zoomer Hall. I'm Kathleen Kajioka. See you next time.